Hi, and welcome to this live chapter reading of The Billionaire and the Therapist by Kim Kobe, hosted by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1. Natalie Ross fingered the long white envelope. Her mouth went dry. It was addressed from the Wheaton State Correctional Facility for Psychiatric Patients. Her stomach clenched with the force of an iron fist. She'd left Pennsylvania and settled in Texas over a year ago. The illusion of distance and safety comforted her weak soul. Her hand trembled as she slowly opened the letter. Everything she w once knew had been torn apart, as if somebody pulled a rug out from under her. When she finally found her footing, it was too late. The damage had been done. She pulled the firmly creased letter out and unfolded the paper. No, she wasn't ready. She quickly shoved the letter back into the envelope. She'd look at it later, any time later. Now wasn't a good time. Her heart raced as she dropped it onto the counter. Natalie swallowed hard and backed away from the envelope. It taunted her from where it sat. She'd have to face it eventually. She steadied her breathing. Natalie inhaled deeply through her nose, then exhaled. After a couple deep breaths, the panic faded. The sooner she read it, the sooner she'd be able to respond. Okay, she could do this. She closed her eyes, said a quick prayer, and picked it back up. She grabbed the letter's edge and pulled it out of the envelope again. Slowly, she unfolded it. Just read the thing. It was the only way to know what was going on. Her shoulders tightened. Her jaw clenched. Focus, Natalie. Focus. She inhaled deeply once again, hoping the air would fill her lungs with the strength she needed to continue. Panic crept up her spine, but she forced it back down. You've got this. The self-talk helped her move forward, but it was only reliable when it wanted to be. Her eyes glazed over as she re read the letter. The words were painful. Too painful. Her inside seized up, bringing the past too quickly to the present. He was up for early release. The maximum sentence was five years, barely anything. At his sentencing, he was only given four years. Instead of the full 48 months he should be serving, they decided to release him at the three-year mark for good behavior. Good behavior? Seriously? It certainly wasn't good behavior that put him in jail. Natalie wrapped her arms around herself in a hug. A chill chased through, through her, even though the Texas heat rarely left her cold. She counted out to see how much time it, she had before his release. Being halfway across the country seemed far enough last year, but now she wasn't so sure. Her sense of security diminished with a single sheet of paper. Psychiatric delusions. Paranoia disorder. It was erotomania, like a form of obsessive love. He was an intimacy seeker. Nausea circled her belly like a ship in a storm being lashed about by angry waves. He'd been convinced she was his soulmate. They were meant to be together. He swore she was secretly in love with him. He believed she routinely sent him, sent him messages through license plates from passing cars or telepathically. Henry Russell forever changed Natalie's world. It started with phone calls, then letters. He showed up at her house and work. His aggressive stalking grew more dangerous with each passing day. He swore they'd be together, no matter what. Their paths crossed the first time at work. He'd been a patient. Natalie was a speech therapist. When their sessions expired, he couldn't say goodbye. He realized during their time together that she was his soulmate. It didn't matter that she'd never expressed feelings for him. He knew. He could feel it, sense it, and knew enough for them both. Henry lived in a state of delusion. When she refused to declare her love for him, he grew angry. Natalie shivered at the memory. She tried to put distance between them, but it only egged him on. He pressed for more therapy sessions, more time together, but again, she refused. He'd crossed the line. He demanded she admit her love and got physical when she wouldn't play along. The terrifying experience was ever-present in her mind. Everything flashed back like a bad nightmare. Natalie went to the front door to double-check that she had locked it behind her. Her fingers slipped over the cool metal of the deadbolt as she made sure it was locked tightly. She unlocked it and then locked it again, taking comfort in the soothing sound of the loud click that said it was in place. She always doubled and triple checked, like some, some obsessive habit. Her mind twisted like an out-of-control tornado. Too many thoughts swirled and rushed at her. She rubbed her arms, trying to calm herself. Okay, he hadn't been released yet, don't panic. The self-talk refused to help this time. He'd come for her, eventually. What would she do then? Would he find her? Would the torment start again? How long would she be forced to live in the past? 
It was all exhausting. She'd withdrawn from life and was suspicious of most everyone. All she wanted was to feel safe. Was that too much to ask? She'd already moved, given up her business, disappeared from the lives of everyone she knew, and become the ghost of herself. All she had left was her work. She'd fo focused more on working with children after that incident, but regardless, every word that came from her mouth was uttered with precision and thought. There was no spontaneity and no joyous laughter. Her days were about getting to work safely, making her home in one piece, and then savagely locking the door behind her. What kind of life was that? She was living a lie. How could she counsel others offering therapeutic skills if she couldn't handle her own situations? At least focusing, focusing on speech therapy helped. And the horses. Hippotherapy was the heart and soul of her work. It soothed her being around them and assisted her clients. The horse or equine therapy, as some called it, as some called it, was a special therapy she'd learned to apply after years of study and becoming certified. The natural movement of the horses helped children form a connection and use different motor skills, along with a different part of their brain. It made their therapy session a fun, caring exercise. Many of the children grew attached to their horses and were encouraged to speak with them. There were multiple reasons when she'd incorporate hippotherapy treatment into her sessions, like if a child had a disability and needed help with balance while working with their speech, or something like selective mutism where it came upon a once talkative child. It was at the stables where she felt safest. The children and horses were non-threatening, something she needed in her life. Natalie skipped making dinner and instead retreated to the comfort of her bed. She drew the soft, fluffy comforter tightly up around her and called her father. Hearing his voice always put her at ease. He knew what to say. He'd help her through. Leaving Pennsylvania meant leaving her family. It was a difficult choice but made sense at the time. Running away and starting over was the only option she could fathom. Staying in Pennsylvania meant that she was too, still too close to her stalker. Prison would only hold him captive for so long. She'd already changed her name, hoping it would at least give her another layer of protection. Her family and lawyer were aware of her new identity, but to the rest of the world, she'd simply disappeared. Carrie Fowler was no more. Natalie Ross grew out of need, not want.